Hello, everybody. This is Derek Demeter with the Emil Bueller Planetarium at Seminole State College, bringing you a exciting program. We have two amazing presenters tonight that are going to tell us about the star knowledge of the Lakota people. Um, so before we begin, I want to mention that if you are also, if you are watching here on YouTube, uh, leave some comments and questions, and maybe some of our presenters will be able to answer those questions uh, later on. Um, anyways, this is also recorded live, so um, you'll also be getting some Q&A as well at the very end of this program. So I want to go ahead and introduce our two presenters tonight um, and uh, we'll go ahead and let them get started with the program. So our presenters tonight are Alexis Estes and Feather um, Mech and uh, I'm going to go ahead and read their biographies for, for them. So uh, Alexis Estes is an enrolled member of the Lower Bruley Sioux tribe with a BA in Indigenous Liberal Studies and is currently pursuing an MA in Counseling Art Therapy. Alexis is very interested in her tribe's cosmologies and incorporates those beliefs into her work as a yoga instructor and mural artist and looks forward to someday opening a healing space rooted in Indigenous philosophies. We also have Feather Mech, and she's an enrolled member of the Little Traverse Bay Band of Ottawa Indians with a BFA in digital art and has been working in immersive and interactive design for almost 10 years. It's always been a passion of hers to share star stories from various Indigenous perspectives as opposed to the common Eurocentric point of view. So with further ado, I'll go ahead and uh, welcome you to tonight's program and Alexis Feather, it's all yours. Um, I can introduce myself first um, and then Alexis can, since she's presenting. Um, Ani, my name is Feather Match, and like Derek said, I'm a little Traverse Bay Band of Ottawa Indians member. I am Anishinaabe. I currently live on the Osage Reservation, Grey Horse Camp in Oklahoma. I am streaming to you from Tulsa, which is on Kado, Kickapoo, Muskogee, Ach Asecti Sakoan and Osage land. Um, if any of you are interested in knowing what land you currently reside on as it um, applies to treaties and historical lands, there is actually a pretty cool app. It's a phone number. You can just text 1-855-917-5263. Text it your city and your state and it will give you that information. Um, so I'm really excited about this today. Uh, something I've always wanted to do. I spend a lot of time in domes and planetariums and I love the stars and I love the stories. And a lot of people are unaware, but there's nearly 600 federally enrolled indigenous tribes in uh, just the America part of Turtle Island alone. And each one of our, we all have different stories uh, pertaining to what we saw when we looked up at the sky, right? And some of our stories intersect, but they're all very separate. So I would like to thank Derek and taking my requests seriously that I really wanted to cover just one tribe at a time and not lump in uh, several tribes to have like a pan indigenous point of view because we all have our different stories. Um, and I reached out to Alexis, who's a colleague of mine, her and I went to college together. Um, I knew that she was a great storyteller about her tribe. so. That is what we'll be focusing on today. And if anyone would be interested in like hearing more stories from different tribal point of views, then reach out uh, my contact information I can give um, at the end of this. And feel free to ask me anything else you want. That's just like a brief intro. Thanks. Well, thanks for that, Feather. Um, really appreciate the, the introductions and the opportunity to be here and to share with you today. First of all, I'd like to introduce myself in Lakota. On Petu Wash Day, Metako Yepi, Alexis Estes, Woksape Olewia, Amachiapi Kshto, Kui Chasha Oyate, Imataha, Naleha, Detroit, Awatihe, Na Euha Chante, Washtea Nape, Chiyuzapi. In Lakota, I said, good day, my name is Alexis. My Lakota name is Seek's Knowledge Woman. I am from the Lower Brule Sioux Tribe and I'm currently residing in Detroit, Michigan, which is his historically Anishinaabe land, or uh, it also may be referred to 
Detroit may be referred to as Wa'awi Wa'atanam. So my relatives, I shake your hand with good feelings in my heart. Today, I am sharing with you about the Wichapi Oyate, the star nation, and of the influence that it has had Are we all good to go with the, now that I've introduced myself, thank you so much for your patience. Um, are we, are we good? Yeah, for the... yeah you, you're, you're all, um, you you have co-host uh, access, so you can go ahead and start whatever you like to do. Okay, great. So thank you so much for your patience, everyone. Um, we're, we've got this figured out now. So we're going to talk about the Wichapi Oyate, the star nation. So the Wichapi Oyate is noted as being the star nation. And when we say nation, we are referring to beings. Um, Lakota people are or organized and orientated themselves to see all life forms as a form of spirit. So the stars, in fact, were viewed as spirit. And this is why we call it the Wichapi Oyate, the star nation. So we're gonna talk about the influence that the star nation has played in our Lakota culture and un in uniting cross-cultural societies. So people across the globe have been impacted by star events and each social group throughout the globe has had different stories to tell but they're based around the same time events. They're based around the same astrological events, cosmic occasions, including but not limited to moon phases, planet visibilities, and asteroid showers. I'd like to talk about the Black Hills. And the reason why I'm talking about a landscape is because oftentimes the landscape through which a society lived upon is how they orientated themselves to the stars. It's where they viewed the stars from. So the Black Hills are the sacred lands of the Lakota nations. The landscape is characterized by tall, dark pines on mountain sides with running streams, flowing streams in between, fresh water. So this area is characterized also by a red dirt ring around the outside of it. If you were to view it from satellite, you would see a red dirt ring. And this ring is known as a sacred circle. It actually plays a part in a story that distinguishes what two-legged people, as in two-legged creatures, not limited to just people, but all two-legged creatures, including birds. And then, so taking the two-leggeds and the four-legged, including all of our four-legged relatives, which are quite too many to name, but just to name a few in this circumstance in the, in the region would have been buffalo, would have been elk, deer, um, even some dogs. So these animals were running next to the two-legged and they served a story that orientated each, each creature's role in the world. So this is just a brief understanding already about the significance of the Black Hills and the symbolisms of the, the landscape. So there are many minerals and gemstones within the Black Hills. In fact, it might not be the first time you've heard of this. It's quite often that in history textbooks, they refer to the gold rush and they refer to westward expansion. So if you've heard of this, well, this is the part where we are coinciding, we are correlating two different histories in one here. We are taking apart an indigenous perspective and we are uniting it with a Western perspective. And when I say Western, I am referring to what we often know in our average American classrooms, our average American public schools, what is readily presented and has been made available. 
and that usually uh, discusses from 1492 up until present. So during this time, we've had quite a big difference now between indigenous knowledge and Western knowledge. So when we're coming back in and we're talking about minerals in the Black Hills, we're comparing two different uh, viewpoints of these minerals. So the, the minerals were known, the gemstones, the, the gold, there's a lot of metal in the Black Hills. There's quartz, rose quartz, gold, and even the Black Hills has its own special type of rose gold, this pink tinted gold that naturally occurs there. So this is, this is just briefly touching on the abundance of minerals within this region. And the pieces of quartz are so large that you can go for a walk and you can find them like the size of our heads just peeping through the grass, just so much abundance. And the reason why I'm talking about these gemstones so much, again, is to contrast these different viewpoints and, and to verify and explain why the Lakota people believed the Black Hills were sacred. They felt this magnetic force, which has been proven by science to in fact exist in the Black Hills region because of so much mineral energy there. So let's talk about Lakota ceremonies because these ceremonies were built around astrological events. There are different sites within the Black Hills that would be visited annually for seasonal ceremonies. On a side note, um, there's some things that I might not share about with you here. You feel free to go ahead and ask some questions and I will do my best um, asking questions towards the end of the program. And I will do my best to answer some of those questions but just giving you a little heads up that there are some um, topics that I may not be able to dive further into out of respect for cultural uh, preservation, cultural knowledge preservation. So a few of the sacred sites in which hold astrological and cultural significance within the Black Hills include Bear Butte, Peshla, which is the bald spot, and Wind Cave. Um, Bear Butte is also frequented often, especially during the time of the summer, which is the, the, um, the renewal time of the Lakota in which we travel out it for times of vision quest or times of solitude, prayers, and seeking answers from ancestors. The bald spot, Peshla, is a center point of the Black Hills. If you were to look at the map of the Black Hills, you'd see it right in the center. And this is why the Lakota believed it to be a mirror of the center of the universe. Given their orientation within the Black Hills, they felt that Peshla um, tied right in to the center of the universe because it was within the center of their red ring. Wind Cave plays a role in the Lakota creation story and an example of a ceremony that was conducted within the Black Hills that marks the transition out from the winter starscape into the summer starscape is the welcoming back of the thunder beings. Um, Wakia Oyate is what they're known as, the thunder beings. And these thunder beings were marked by a particular constellation. Um, first of all, the, the significance of the Wakia Oyate is that as, as humans, we have a connection to earth and we need it for sustenance. In fact, the Lakota did. So prayers to, to beings who provide rain and nourishment for crops, for sustenance, they would be prayed to. And so this is what that ceremony would include. And it would, it would, uh, stargazers would look up at the stars and they would look specifically for this constellation that the Lakota identify as the Thunderbird. And given an astronomer sort of perspective, this is recognized primarily as the Gamma Draconi with two stars coming from the Ursa Minor's bull. The ceremonies in the Black Hills usually occurred during spring, summer, and fall. There's less documented about ceremonies occurring in winter, but
but there's reason to suspect that since there's not as many ceremonies in winter, that this was a time in which community members would naturally be observing the stars in the clear night skies of the winter and be able to share stories. In understanding the convergence of the Lakota perspective and the United States perspective on the history of the Black Hills, it's important to note how the United States perspective is that, well, it's very law-based, law and so they would enforce treaties in, in the past couple centuries, in fact, there were some treaties enforced and laws to seize indigenous land while the Lakota and many other Native American tribes, so it's not just limited, this is an, a general uh, indigenous philosophy that the land is not viewed as a sellable object, it's not for sale, it is viewed as a relative that provides and that is tended to that by the people to continue to provide sustenance. So one such act that played a role on the seizure of indigenous land is the Indian Claims Commission, an action by the United States, which was actually to thank some Native Americans for their service in World War II and as a way to relieve the anxiety caused by United States history, the, the colonization of the Americas left a, a pretty sour relationship between some of these um, military members who were of indigenous descent. And so this made it a, a grounds for this commission to let some of these members get monetary compensation for territory lost as a result of broken federal treaties. However, by accepting the government's monetary offer, the tribe released any right to raise their claim again in the future. So sometimes a tribe would give up federal recognition as in order to be able to claim that land. But here's the catch here is the Lakotas of the Black Hills of South Dakota rejected the United States land offer in stating that the Black Hills were never for sale. Um, nowadays, the, the Black Hills are also under threat for uranium mining. So if, if preservation of land and good health are important to you, uh, feel free to look further into these causes as there's many ways to assist. Um, and, and once once again, I don't know if I said that within my last sentence there, but that the land claim is the longest lasting, This the claim of the Black Hills is the longest lasting indigenous land claim that still is ongoing today. The Lakota people tribes have not accepted any of that settlement and it's still being just dis, um, disputed. Following along, let's talk now a little bit about um, shapes and, and how shapes of the cosmos kind of influenced some of the shapes within art and culture of the Lakota people. Spirals and symbols have been influenced by Lakota star knowledge. Ceremonies occurred within the Black Hills in a spiral formation. So starting out around that red outer corner of the Black Hills and working its way into the center. This is the order that ceremonies would take place. So earlier on in the year, we start out on the outside and we gradually progress in. So spiral formations have been a chosen shape also when the Lakota draw winter counts. So winter counts are a, a painting that would be on a hide, usually buffalo were, were, um, were frequent, they were, they were uh, provided a, a source of food, a, a sense of shelter, and this hide necessary for a winter count. So each family within a community would have a winter count and they would use this to depict what happened to them. And the reason why I'm mentioning this with a discussion about star knowledge is because the stars are a way of telling time. So 
they would be able to look at the moon cycles and they would be able to distinguish what astrological events were happening. And then those would show up on the winter counts. So they might compare what was happening um, within their social group and they might categorize it as this was happening when this astrological event was taking place. So um, the symbolism of the spiral, if, if you're looking at this visual right here, you might start to think, well, wait a second, where have I seen this spiral in space before? We have seen this spiral in galaxies and galaxy clusters. We have seen the spiral, if we were to film a time lapse, of planets moving around, they would be moving in a spiral-like formation. So such is, the, such is spiral a representation of time because when a spiral happens, it reoccurs and it comes across similar cycles, but yet it never occurs quite the same event. It's never exactly the same point in time once again. So Lakotas perceive time as cyclical, which is marked by the changing of moons and the seasons. The themes and symbols of these occurrences are consistent and occur regularly, but never quite the same, just as I just explained, just as you're seeing here. So it curves, the spiral curves similarly to other points within the shape, but never repeats following along with the 13 moon phases or moon cycles. This should sound fairly familiar as our calendars do go by 12 months in a year. And this is paralleling to moon cycles, or it can be. Um, when, when the Lakota were viewing the moon cycles, they noted that there were 13 within the Lakota year. And these, these 13 cycles marked four different seasons. And each moon corresponds to different harvests and to different annual events. So the Waitu, Waitu is winter in Lakota. The Waitu it has moons, moons within it. Um, excuse me, I, I hopped along. The Waitu is um, this spring. Okay, we're going to start in spring and then we're going to end winter. So the spring, way two, the spring moons include the moon when ducks come back, the moon of making fat, and the moon when the leaves turn green. In the summer, the blocketu, the summer moons include the moon of the June berries, the moon when the choke cherries are ripe, and the moon of the harvest. The Praniyatu, the autumn moons, include the moon when the leaves turn brown, the moon when the wind shakes off leaves, and the moon of the rutting deer. And finally, back to winter, Waniyatu. Waniyatu moons include the moon when deer shed their horns, the hard moon, the moon when trees crack from the cold and the moon of sore eyes or also known as snow blindness. When we're talking about planets and what was visible to the naked eye for the Lakota, well, every once in a while, another planet might be visible to the naked eye because of its placement and orientation to the sun. But here I'd like to focus on the planet Venus, which is often known to Lakota people and not just Lakota people, but there are many indigenous groups actually that refer to the planet Venus as the morning star. Since it is in closer orbit to the sun and to earth, where then some of the other planets, the further planets in the solar system, we're more likely to see it with the naked eye. And at dawn in the morning, early in the morning when the sun is barely up and we can still see the brightness of the stars out there, 
out in the night sky, we can see the planet Venus. And the planet Venus is able to catch the sun's rays and shine very brightly in the morning. Hence its nickname as the morning star. The presence of this planet each morning represents the gift of hope, the gift of a new day, which conveys a sense of hope in its symbolism. The symbol of the morning star is often depicted on star quilts. Star quilts are a form of quilts that the Lakota often make and they continue to make today as a tradition. It's important to note the origin of the star quilt, which in fact came from uh, the boarding school era. So while we're looking at something so beautiful and so symbolic and a, a piece of our tradition and art history, let's also recognize the, the deeper history behind it. Because this quilt, uh, was taught that not the geometric shapes, but the, the quilting itself is a trade skill that was forced upon uh, Lakota and other indigenous youth who were forcibly relocated into boarding schools. They were removed from their homes and communities and taken to boarding school settings to uh, as Richard Pratt, who started the whole boarding school trend or of that time, Richard Pratt started Carlisle Indian School. He said, kill the Indian, save the man. And so this was the mission of all these boarding schools that were teaching these youth to make trade crafts and skills, including sewing, including for for men, it might be some more um, laborious sort of jobs, more factory-like. For women, it might include more um, nanny-like jobs, more of uh, service around the house. And so this star quilt and its dark history symbolizes hope emerging from the darkness. These children, these Lakota children incorporated these subtle Lakota symbolisms, such as this eight pointed geometric star, which is a depiction of the morning star into their trades and it provided them hope, but they couldn't explain the symbols correlation to their culture. No way could they share that with their school board out of fear of punishment. And I'm talking severe punishment, physical punishment. They could not share these stories. They had to keep it a secret. But together, knowing what they were making provided a sense of community and a sense of hope in a dark place. Since then, star quilts have become a staple item of Lakota culture, and they are gifted to community members upon significant life transitions, such as birth, puberty, coming of age, birthdays, graduations, marriages, other accomplishments in life and in death. All of these significant uh, life transitions. And I would like to say that this is not just a thing of the past. It is in fact a living, breathing art form that exists today. My, my grandma made star quilts, my aunt makes star quilts and you know, I think that puts me up next in line to make a star quilt, which is why I have one on my back as a tattoo. Hopping along here, let's talk about the Milky Way. The star belt across the sky that is often known to uh, astronomers as the Milky Way or more known in an average sense is the Milky Way. And it's, it's traveling the sky from the Northern point to the Southern point. So this, this symbolism is actually very strong. It represents growth. It represents some um, expansion and growth. For example, if it was horizontally, 
it would have a totally different meaning. But because of our orientation on Earth and it being vertical, it has a highly significant symbolism to the Lakota people. The Lakota people call the, more, the um, Milky Way the Wanagi Tachanku, which means the, the pathway that the spirits travel. So the spirits travel along this point, and it is believed that when spirits leave the body, they will travel along the spirit road. And then when spirits descend as babies, they will travel, their spirit will travel through this road and descend to earth. So there are two constellations that play a significant role in the descent uh, of children's spirits onto the earth. So as we're traveling here through, we can imagine the, the spirit of children and the way they descend onto earth. The girl spirits, uh, according to Lakota stories, originate from Kea, the turtle, the turtle constellation. And the the boys are believed to descend from Agleshka, the salamander constellation. While this slide is still up here, uh, that Feather has nicely shared there, the Kea, the turtle constellation, while we're looking at this, we can note that the four stars of the Pegasus square, plus a faint head and tail of other nearby stars, are what the Lakota were seeing as their turtle constellation. And moving on to the Agleshka, the Agleshka, the salamander constellation is made up of the stars of Cygnus and the surrounding Milky Way. So Lakota mothers, Lakota mothers knew these stories and they would include the symbolisms of the turtle and the salamander into their beadwork to honor these constellations, to honor where their children descended from. So Lakota mothers would bead, uh, bead pouches in the shapes of these animals and then it would contain the children's umbilical cord out of respect and honor for their child's soul connection to the cosmos. Lastly, I would like to talk about cottonwood trees. And once again, we're coming back to a piece of nature and we're kind of thinking, what might this have to do with the cosmos? Well, it has quite a lot to do with the cosmos, once again, in terms of its symbolism and, and its symbolism even in ceremony. So touching briefly on that topic, uh, cottonwood trees are used in Sundance ceremonies, Lakota Sundance ceremonies. And the reason that this particular tree is chosen is because it's a very, very tall tree in comparison to what other trees are available in the greater plains region. Outside of the Black Hills, because the Black Hills have a lot of pine trees and they're elevated, but outside of that, the actual reservations that Lakota people have been moved onto are actually quite, um, quite open plains. So the cottonwood tree really stood out as being quite a tall tree, quite a closely related tree further up into the cosmos. So the roots that dig into the earth mirror the branches that expand into the sky. Um, I'll go ahead to share a brief little thing here. I, I did get a, a little tattoo with that. Um, with this symbolism. So the roots are digging into the earth. They mirror the branches in the sky. From this symbolism, there is an, a geometric hourglass shape drawn that depicts as above, so below philosophy. This symbol 
is referred, um, it's referenced often in beadwork. You might see it in beadwork. You might see it in uh, parflesh rawhide container paintings. And it, it's important to note that whenever an artist will add an additional shape to the hourglass symbol, then the shape also gets added on the opposite side of the symbol to keep the two halves symmetrical. Her symbolisms, dualities are very important in terms of art and philosophy to the Lakota people. And the best part is that these insights are drawn from the cosmos. With that, I am grateful for your support of our indigenous ways of knowing and attending Wichapi Oyate, the star knowledge of the Lakotas. I hope that you found this presentation insightful and informative of the star knowledge of Lakota culture, and that you are able to see some parallels between our understanding of the Lakota Wichapi Oyate, the star nation, and a Western astronomy's views of the cosmos. Please assist me in thanking my colleague, Feather Metch, and the email Bueller Planetarium for their efforts to make this presentation possible with a round of applause. And let the metaphorical web of the stars and our stories continue to unite humanity across cultures. Matakuye Oyasi, we are one, we are related. Kalamia, uh, Wobi Latanka, thank you so much. All right, thank you so much, Alexis and Feather for this great presentation. Um, we have a couple of questions. If you, don't, if you all don't mind answering some questions, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, um, go through them. So what I'll do is I'll go ahead and ask the question and either one of you can take that question. All right. So this question here is, are there specific relationships between the cosmos water nexus that described a water ethic practices that define the tribe's point of view and teachings that are handed down? Hi, I am. Um, I'm scrolling on through just to try to try to break that down again. So I got the part about water and I got the fact that we're trying to understand a little bit more about um, water and water symbolism. Um, can, you, can you provide me with just one more keyword and then I think I can answer this. Yeah, so the question is, are there specific relationships between the cosmos water nexus that describe the water ethic? Um, practices that define the tribe's point of view. So what's the point of view and teachings that are handed down on this practice of the, of the water, uh, at cosmos water nexus? I guess that. <laughs> okay. Um, well, if we're referring to the cosmos and we're referring to um, a constellation, then that is not necessarily something I could dive into, but it can dive into the symbolisms and the Lakota perspective of uh, water, water rights, and how it ties into philosophy. Um, and some of some of us are probably very well aware of uh, of water protecting and water rights, and. And this is really important. In fact, a lot of indigenous cultures have lots of words, not just one word to describe their water. They have lots of words, like in their indigenous languages, there are so many different words just to describe water. So we might have, um, we might have snow, we might have sleet, we might have hail, we might have all these different words. So, when we're talking about water, it's important to understand that indigenous people, Lakota people have a very close connection to nature, um, actually having to live directly in nature and as nomadic people, they would have to pack up and leave and be able to quickly, um, 
quickly head out, for example, if there was an enemy approaching or if the buffalo were on a, on a run and they had to follow the source of food, they had to quickly move, which meant that they were really, really able to pay attention to the weather. They were really able to pay attention to the cosmos and what that indicated about weather coming. So if we can see a little bit that the there's so many different words for water. There's so many different um, feelings about protecting water rights because of the significance that water has had um, in, in being able to provide and provide a life force. Um, and I, and I, last thing I will say about that is in the Lakota origin story, well, water is talked about as the second uh, element on on our planet, right after Ina, rock. Water comes next and water is considered, Mini, Mini is considered the life force, the blood of the planet. Fantastic. Uh, before we go on to another question, uh, Feather, you mentioned that you have um, a, a, possibly a link to, if anybody would like to uh, provide a donation to um, your uh, organization, presentation, whatnot. Right. Um, so Alexis and I have had a super fun time putting this together. We're both wrapping up degrees right now. So this is our finals week. It's been crazy. Um, but if anybody would like to donate to us potentially trying to do further projects together or be being able to outreach to other people from different tribes, um, I can link. It's just my name, Feather Metch for PayPal or Venmo. And Alexis and I also agreed that if we got any donations that we we're going to share a portion of them to um, Black Hills Preservation as well as Indigenous Youth um, Digital Storytelling. So if anybody would like to um, donate on PayPal, I think it's just feather dash match and then on Venmo it's feather match and that'd be greatly appreciated if you're so um, inclined. And then I guess one thing about the water question too, I'm not Lakota, so this is like off topic of this particular presentation. I'm a Dawa, but um, we have a Thunderbird story as well, which Alexis told a little bit about. And um, part of our Thunderbird origin story is directly related to the water. He comes from the sky and then is too powerful. And my tribe is right on the Great Lakes. So there's a lot of water and he, uh, the Thunderbird went into the water and now he's like the water protector. So I, I think there's similar epistemologies in Lakota symbolism where the Thunderbird is like the protector of sacred entities such as water and he came from the sky. So it's kind of this like uh, star person, star character, but then they also like protect things on earth. So that's like the point of view for my culture at least. Yeah, I think it, this is all sound. This is all super fascinating. I love it. Uh, and and Feather, if you want to go ahead and post that uh, that information in the chat uh, okay. for your donation, um, I'll go ahead and start with the next question. Um, next question I have is: You mentioned two stars in Ursa Minor, uh, I think, that were associated with thunder beings. Could you say that part again? Which stars are they? Are you looking it up? I know we were looking this up earlier today. <laughs> yes, we, we definitely were. I know Alexis um, knows because she had to send it to me earlier today for visual. <laughs> I will uh, totally find it. Okay, with the constellation of the, I think I said that one last, last week. Um, okay, for the, thun the thunder beings which we just talked about okay so so the gamma draconi with two stars on the outside of the gamma draconi those two stars are coming from the ursa minor's bowl so within the ursa minor there is like a bowl like shape and those are where those stars are coming from excellent um, so, uh, what makes the cottonwood tree so tall? We have, a, we have a question about that. Um, so what makes the cottonwood tree so tall is the fact that 
the Lakota have been for forcibly, or they, you know, they protected, first of all, the Black Hills, but after the Black Hills, there were so many different land claims where they were eventually put onto very barren uh, plains reservations. So we're talking about perhaps of all the Great Plains, we're talking about some of the least, least nourishing plots of land that the Lakota were designated for their reservations. Um, uh, I, I will say there are two exceptions. So just in case you've heard of by chance of Standing Rock and the significance it played, um, that, that reservation as well as mine, the Lower Brule Sioux Tribe, those are a couple of reservations that happen to be on bodies of water, the Missouri River. But aside from that, um, some of our other Lakota reservations are on very barren plots of land without any uh, water bodies or tall trees around. So the fact that the cottonwood tree was still able to live in these barren landscapes is the reason why it was, um, it was referred to as like a very symbolic piece of ceremony. And it also stood out because none of the other trees were growing nearly as high. Most of them are shrubs. One of the coolest things I found in my research too, when Alexis was telling me about the cottonwood trees is um, this vigil that's up right now. That's what the interior of the twigs look like. So they have literal stars inside, which I thought was really cool. <laughs> Uh, no, it's definitely super cool. I'm going to have to now take a look at that in real life here. Um, another question we have is actually related to the area of Michigan. Um, are there, is there any astronomy or sky legends of the Big and Little Bear from the Big and Little Manitou Islands? Uh, many, yes. <laughs> um, that's exactly right where my tribe is. My tribe is located um, just under those islands. Uh, so ancestrally, that would have been like our territory. Um, there are quite a few. A big reason I have decided to collaborate with like multiple storytellers is because I'm not, I personally feel like I'm still on like my cultural journey. I don't feel like an expert on like specific topics of my culture. Um, but I do know a lot about there are, um, like I was saying Thunderbird earlier is a star being that ended up going into um, the Great Lakes. And um, I can try to find some resources and put them in the chat or whatever. Um, there are some really good indigenous astronomers out there that uh, have more like scientific specifics. Um, I can't remember what you said, but the, the big bear, little bears, uh, the stories I've heard about those specific, um, if it's the same landmass that I'm thinking of, it's this like peninsula that has these hills where one looks like a mama bear and then there's like three smaller ones. And it's not necessarily um, star related, it's more water related. And uh, the stories that the, the sons went out and drowned in the lake and the mom is there waiting for them. But I'm not sure if that's the same landmass they're referencing or not. And, and Feather, you could probably help with this question. The uh, Adawa peoples of Oklahoma, is the Little Traverse Bay area the area of origin? Is it also related to Ottawa, Canada? Um, I just live in Oklahoma right now on the Osage Reservation. Um, my tribe has never been relocated and they are in Upper Michigan. So the Anishinaabe people um, originated up in the northeastern part of what is now Canada and America. And some of us uh, migrated to the Great Lakes. And we are also um, part of a Three Fires Confederacy, which is the Ojibwe, Potawatomi, and Adawa, and then it's kind of interchangeable with Ottawa, which maybe some of you are more familiar with, O-T-T-A-W-A. -A. Um, my tribe specifically, we were federalized later, so we chose um, a different spelling that was closer to our dialect, so that's why it's spelled O-D-A-W-A, -A. but um, other than being different bands, we are related to the, to the Ottawa in Canada. All right, excellent. And then uh, we have another question is, how is the planet Venus connected to the Lakota? Ooh, I like that story. You should talk about that one a little bit more. Lakota, Alexis. The morning star stuff. 
Um, well, okay. So if, there, if there's a, if there's a story you're thinking of further than I am a bit very curious, what I, what I am definitely thinking about is, um, I, I'm, I'm just seeing it as more of the morning star as in it provided a sense of hope being in the dawn every morning. Uh, it also, like the planet Venus being the morning star, once again, its, it's role is heavily involved in art and Lakota art. So um, if you have another story beyond that feather, I'm very curious and open to it. I'm kind of just having a little bit of trouble seeing past like the um, my, my heart really got stuck on boarding school because my father attended a boarding school and we are still, ex our family is still experiencing some of the traumas or post traumas that come with that experience. So my heart is very stuck on the fact that the star quilt was made as a symbol of hope. Um, Feather, if you do have another story you'd like to share about the morning star, then please do. Everything I learned, I learned from you, and it was that I could I could feel so much passion in it um, when I read your script and when we rehearsed. And uh, so I don't know anything additional to you, but I think just to answer their question is the reason it's so important to Lakota culture is because it was one of the only visible planets first thing in the morning. So, um, you know, we didn't have electricity and we were living outside and it was a, a symbol of, you know, something that you can see every morning that's bright and visible in the sky. And then I really thought it was beautiful the way Alexis was able to tie that into like modern culture and how it's been used as imagery and stuff. All right, excellent. Um, and we have another question here. Is the symbolism of spirals applied to animals with natural spirals like snails? We put spirals in everything. <laughs> it's like our- Yeah, definitely. It's not just a visual, like a cue, it's like a philosophical, like a philosophy among a lot of native cultures, um, especially like Lakota and Hopi and um, some of the other Pueblos. Uh, it's a really important, I think Alexis phrased it really well where she said it, it's a symbol of like cyclical parts of life, but it's never quite the same circle, you know? So I thought that was a really like excellent way of explaining it. and. Uh, we we would look up and see them in the cosmos, you know. So of course that like mirrored our our life, you know, down here to look up and see the Milky Way and you know other other constellations that were in the same shape. And I, and of course I'm sure we recognize them as well in nature, like all sorts of plants and animals and everything. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I second all all of it. I love that feather. Brought up a couple other tribes and their usage of the spiral so it it just wasn't um you know it wasn't it seems as though nowadays it might be kind of hard glancing around and finding a piece of nature that directly says hey i'm a spiral shape or you know you get that when you look at it but when when indigenous people were living they were readily observing the land and nature every day like day after day they were learning from animals and the way they behaved with one another to see like what worked and what didn't, what medicines are good and what medicines don't work. Um, so through these observations of nature, they were able to find significant shapes that held deeper symbolisms to them. And the spiral was one of them. Um, a couple other things that I might just throw out there because Feather threw out the, um, the Hopi and the fact that the spiral has been in some, some more Hopi or Pueblo symbolisms. Uh, the, if you were to go, oh yeah, I love Valentina commenting there, um, especially because this is a, our, our, um, our friend here. We, we in fact did go to uh, Chaco Canyon and some of these sacred sites of, of Pueblo culture um, and my, my daughter is Pueblo. So it really stood out to me to learn some of these things for her. Um, the spiral symbolism was oftentimes in cave, like not quite cave paintings, but more like rock paintings.
paintings. Like if you go to visit these sites in the Four Corners region, you will see spiral symbols painted on the walls. And this was referred to when, when journeys were taking place or even like when a move would happen, they could create a spiral and it would symbolize the journey. And then if they moved a location, they would draw a spiral at the other location where they ended up and it would show the literal journey of where they started from and then where they, the line that they went and that they found themselves there. So that is something that I just know um, from my time in the Southwest as uh, Feather and I went to school in New Mexico and Santa Fe together. Excellent. Yeah, no, that, I, this has been a wonderful experience tonight. Um, we don't have any other questions uh, that I can see. So uh, I want to thank both Feather and Alexis for your time. This was a wonderful presentation. It seems like everybody thoroughly enjoyed it. So if you're on YouTube uh, watching this, uh, be sure to give a like on that and make some comments too, so we can all see those. Uh, at later on. So um, again, um, any other information either one of you want to mention before we wrap things up? Any other uh, information as far as additional resources that people can find out more about Lakota or any other indigenous tribes that you would like to share? I saw someone asked about my necklace. It's by uh, Jay Akuma and it's from by Yellowtail B or no, it's not, it's from uh, Beyond Buckskin that only sells indigenous uh, products. So if you like native jewelry, um, I always like jewelry questions, <laughs> even though they're not related, but I'm passionate. I think most natives are pretty passionate about their jewelry. Um, so uh, definitely if you, anyone wants to email me, my name is Feather Match, you can ask me anything, even if it's um, where to get cool jewelry, I'll let you know. Um, and then I know, I don't, Alexis, I think, had some uh, links if you want to know more information on what you can do to like help preserve the Black Hills. Uh, yeah, yeah, and uh, honestly, I don't know if I, I really want to provide those links. I just don't know if I could exit out of here and see where they're at, but. Um, People can so find them otherwise probably pretty easily. Yeah, definitely. How about um, I'll let you know that there's some some organizations like within um, the Black Hills, there are some ways to help like water protectors. There's ways to um, find out more if you are interested in Lakota star knowledge. The reason why I um, knew some of these things or knew some of these origin stories is because of First, I went to Sinti Gleshka, Sinti Gleshka University. It's a tribal college in Rosebud, South Dakota on the Rosebud Sioux tribe. And the reason why I'm mentioning this is because our, our elders hold a lot of our stories and hold a lot of the star knowledge. Their ancestors, their elders taught them these stories. And with every elder that no longer is on this plane of existence, then stories have a tendency to, to go if there's not someone to carry the message on. And, and this is a really important part um, about tribal colleges is that the, some of the tribal colleges are pres preserving some of that information and willing and able to um, collaborate with other universities and able to exchange and share knowledge such as this. So you might wanna check out the Sinti Gleshka University. You might even check them out on YouTube because they in fact do have some of their Lakota star knowledge classes, um, some of their other teachings and health, cultural based, um, cultural arts classes, all those that actually are on YouTube. So if you are interested, um, look up Sinti Gleshka, S-I-N-T-E, Gleshka, G-L-E-S-K-A, University on YouTube. And you'll find some more of those um, origin stories. Let's see, is there anything else that I quite have to share? Um, I guess those, those organizations, um, please do look them up. I, I personally, since, since we have some friends in 
different places. I am not quite thinking of just one organization off the top of my head because we have a, an extensive community of, of nonprofits and affiliates that would really benefit from, um, from having more uh, eyes on them to take in this information. So I, I can't quite reference an exact one just like off the top of my head. Um, if you do think of one feather, go ahead and insert it in. I have um, um, a short like bibliography of some of the visuals I did. We had a little bit of a, a tech problem. Hopefully you guys didn't notice. So not all my visuals got put up, but um, all of these are Lakota, either artists or scientists. So I used some graphics by Sadie Redwing, who Alexis and I went to school with. She's a really amazing Lakota graphic designer who I also interned with at NASA. So she's very interested in like art, science and culture. And then um, some of the other visuals were from Lakota scientists, uh, James Sanovia and Craig Howe were two of them. Uh, if anybody would like to read further into the research, they've been published quite a bit. Cool. Oh, yeah, yeah, cool. And I guess Feather, I, I guess like last things, maybe last things last is um, you and I both, both have different things that we are constantly working on as we're going to school as well. So just um, soft mention is part of the reason that I was really interested today to talk about star knowledge is also, you know, also because yes, I'm Lakota, I have a history of studying this, uh, pursuing this education field, but I am also um, in astrology, or so astronomy, astrology, <laughs> two words separate, um, astrology. So I actually do, um, tarot card readings and astrology. And it's, uh, I've been having a lot of fun kind of seeing cross parallels between these sorts of things, um, especially because Lakota stories, uh, is, star knowledge is a form of storytelling. Art is a form of storytelling. And likewise, um, these services are also forms of storytelling with which to tell uh, meaningful stories such as this. How about you, Feather? Um, I think I'm good, unless there's any more questions. I'd just like to thank the planetarium for having us. This is something we've wanted to do for so long. We'd love to do more of it. So if anybody's ever interested, this was like our first run and obviously we're not, I tried to make it look like we're in a planetarium, but we're not. So um, I'm looking forward to everyone getting healthy, staying healthy so that we can all hang out inside of domes again, because I miss it so much. Absolutely. Maybe maybe we'll have both of you out physically to the planetarium one day. Maybe we can do, or or who knows? Maybe we can do something somewhere else. So thank you so yeah, much, uh, Feather and Alexis, for this presentation tonight, and thank you for all that have attended today's program. Um, and for those that are on YouTube, thank you for stopping by and, and watching this. So, um, of course, uh, we have other programs uh, that are coming up. We have a program on May 14th at 7 p.m. We're uh, hosting it with a um, individual named Catherine Hunt. She's with the Ingram Planetarium uh, in North Carolina. And uh, we're working on a program called River of Heaven Asian Astronomy. So uh, we're going to go uh, to pre predominantly Southeastern Asian cultures and look at their understanding of um, astronomy. So uh, per part of this purpose is to, as uh, Feather, uh, Feather mentioned in their biography, we're trying to uh, celebrate all of us. We are one, right? And we have this passion for the sky. All human beings have this passion for the sky. And it is our role to give them a chance to uh, to shine and give us a chance to share some amazing astronomical uh, programming uh, from around the world. So we'll be doing more of these and uh, be sure to follow our page at the uh, Seminal Planet. That's uh, our YouTube page as well as our Facebook and Instagram. So again, thank you so much Feather and Alexis for today and uh, we will see you all again soon. Thank you so much. Thanks guys.